Now in cinemas, Leica's fourth stop-motion feature film, Kubo and the Two Strings, is the most visually adventurous yet, expanding on animation processes established with their previous entries Coraline, Paranorman, and The Box Trolls. Set in a fantastical ancient Japan, Kubo and the Two Strings pays tribute to such pioneers of the cinema epic genre as Kurosawa, Miyazaki, David Lean, and Ray Harryhausen, while embracing an original story by Shannon Tyndall, Mark Hames, and Chris Butler, in which young Kubo must collect the scattered pieces of his father's armor in order to evade and conquer his evil pursuers. Squiggly met with the film's director and Leica CEO Travis Knight to learn more about the challenges of approaching a stop-motion project of this scale. Obviously you've been heavily involved in all the Leica films so far, but from what I can gather this is your first time as a director, is that right? That's right, yes. Cool. Because it's not really making it easy for yourself in terms of the scale of this film, it's <laughs> the hugest one. No. I did not take it easy on myself. It, you know, Kubo is by far the most ambitious thing that we've ever done at Leica. Uh, we'd never even attempted something of this scale, this size, this kind of this sweeping, big, fancy epic. It's something that you typically don't see in animation, specifically in stop motion animation. And for good reason, because it turns out it's really hard. When you understand how a stop motion film was made, which is essentially the way we make films, our studio is in Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest of America. And we have this big crummy warehouse where we have these these you know these wooden tabletops that you gussy up to try to make like a look like it's a real place and you you you're shooting these things at small scale i mean our our hero kubo he's about you know 9 9 and a half inches tall and he's you know he's walking along in this set and you want it to feel like a stop motion david lean film and uh, it's it's kind of silly to to think you could shoot something at that scale and make it feel big and sweeping and yet that was the story that we were telling we knew that we wanted to tell a big fantasy and to do that you need scale you need scope and uh, and so it really required every single department to come up with new ways of of making you know making their art that it would on the screen it would feel like a big epic fantasy and it was not easy but uh, I'm really proud of the way it came together hmm. well, even without any sort of stereoscopic elements like just to sort of look at it you can tell there's a huge amount of depth and these amazing sweeping landscapes, mm -hmm. even that some of them are just on screen for a couple of seconds. I mean, were they all like built for purpose? Yeah, I mean, our, our process is, it's a big roiling gumbo of different techniques. Uh, we combine art, craft, science, and technology. And so, you know, it's techniques that go back over 100 years. I mean, stop motion is effectively one of the first visual effects techniques that was ever developed. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, some of the things that we're doing on Kubo is the same way that Georges Méliès was doing when he was sending rockets to the moon. Uh, you know, you still have a, a set uh, with lights and, a, you know, a puppet and a camera and an animator bringing these things to life a frame at a time. But we also use matte paintings, we use uh, digital set extensions, we shoot miniatures that we then, you know, put together in compositing. And so it's a lot of different techniques that you end up using to bring this thing to life in the best way. And we just, you know, early on in the process, we get the, in the entire team together and we start talking about what's the best way to bring this thing to life visually. And so it's just a ton of different techniques that we use at the studio to make these things really uh, spark on the screen. But I think it's unusual. The way we make films at Leica is really unlike anywhere else in the world. And it's because of all those different techniques converging. I did see a name on the credits as well as one of the animators, and presumably in a different capacity than before. Yeah. Directing myself was weird. <laughs> um, yeah, on the, on the previous films, uh, you know, I've overseen the films. I've been, you know, lead animator on the films. So doing a ton of animation. And on this film, I wanted to do the same thing. I still wanted to, you know, really get in the trenches and get my hands dirty and bring these puppets to life a frame at a time. Uh, but as an animator, what you need is time. And as a director, what you don't have is time. So it required, you know, trying to find ways, creative ways that I could actually still get in there and bring these things to life, but uh, but schedule the day so the, the, you know, the production kept running. Because as, as a director, I mean, you're at the nexus of every every single decision. You're at the you know, absolute center of all the artistic and creative and technical decisions. And in order to keep the show running, you can't, you know, you can't spend time out on the floor animating. So usually the way I would do it is at the beginning of the day, before anybody would show up, I'd go out and you know crank out a handful of frames. They would start. I'd direct all day, or you know you know work on overseeing the company. And then at the end of the day, when everyone left, I'd go out and crank out a few more frames on my set. It was slow going, but um, it's always been a huge part of what I do is to you know to keep my hands directly involved in, in creating the art. And I think it goes to what we stand for. Like is that we are really a community of artists, and we love creating this, these beautiful stories and, and, and bringing these projects to life with our hands. And, and I, I think you see that in every frame of Kubo. Absolutely. Has that animation background, has that informed your approach as a director, sort of knowing what it's like to 
be in the trenches, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it has to. Uh, I don't know any other way. <laughs> I've been an animator for pretty much my whole life. Working professionally, I've been working animation for 20 years. And so it just it, it's just kind of part of my blood. It just infuses the way I think, the way I look at the world. And so I think it, it I'm sure it absolutely kind of wove into my perspective on how we were making this movie. But it also, I think it, it was a great experience because I was able to communicate with the animators in a way that probably their directors haven't typically done. Uh, you know, most of the other uh, directors who've who worked at the studio? They're they're not professional animators. They you know they come from different you know from storyboarding or they come from different aspects of, of the process. So to be able to, to collaborate with the animators on the show with one of their own with someone that they've worked side by side in the trenches, it was it was an incredibly rewarding experience. We were able to talk about performance in a really meaningful way because we all do the same thing and and it was a it was a great collaboration and I think because of that. I think some of the animation on this film is just absolutely exquisite. It's just extraordinary because we were all working from the same perspective. Mm -hmm.